And new share, share. Okay, do you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay, that's good. All right. So just to kind of restate where we've already been with things. Um, last week and the week before, we were talking about really the first two pieces of this three by three writing matrix that we talked about, okay, right? We said that the elements of this, the first piece is, you know, planning your communication, which includes what information does my audience need and what strategy are you going to take in addressing your audience? And then going about the process of beginning to assemble all the data that you need, okay? And then the next piece we talked about last week, and that was the writing the first draft. We talked about that in, in some, you know, um, in some extent. And if you need to go back and, you know, review that again, um, it might be the easiest thing for you to do is just to watch the video that's, you know, in Canvas now. So this week, we're picking up with the third phase of that three by three, you know, process, we're going to talk about revising our written communication. Okay. So for instance, an example of that is my discussion with you a minute ago about what success looks like for you. What, what are your goals for the future? Okay. So if you didn't do what I've been sharing with you, if you haven't done that yet, then this, that would be part of your revision process, okay? So let's let's uh, see what's involved in, in revisions. Well, we can look at things in, in you know, when, we, when we're reviewing, when we're um, proofing and editing these documents, one of the things that we want to look out for is called a flabby expression, okay? When I think of, when you think of a flabby person, how would you describe a person who as, what would that person kind of look like if you say that they're flabby? They move around a lot? Uh, like that's they not use really like hand gestures or something I'm sorry, like say that again? Like they'd use hand gestures or something like that, like a lot? No, that's, that's not flabby. Um, flabby is um, uh, having a lot of excess weight that you don't need, okay? So when we talk about flabby expressions, it means that this sentence or paragraph or paper that you wrote has a lot of extra stuff in it, a lot of extra words that don't add any more meaning to what you've written. They're just there. They're not helping you carry your intent forward at all. You could lose a ton of that and not lose one iota of the message that you wanted to communicate. So when we write, we wanna make sure that it's not flabby, okay? And we'll look at that in a bit. Another one would be long lead-ins. What do you think a lead, when I talk about a lead-in to your writing, what would you guess a lead-in is? Kind of like the intro. Yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. An intro. Again, a, a long intro isn't really adding anything extra in terms of content to the message. It's just this big, long, you know, gas, right? It's just a bunch of hot air that we don't need. And in business, we want to write very concisely or efficiently the, 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 with, without giving up any of the essential communication, okay? You remember, it's costing the company money for you to write that big flabby document. 
and it's also costing the um, uh, company money for somebody else in the organization to read your big flabby document. In both cases, you're wasting time and in business, time is money. So the company looks at it like, well, that's pretty or boy, doesn't that just sound like beautiful language or something? Oh, it's so Shakespearean, <laughs> but you haven't done anything to move the business forward. Okay, so you've wasted time and effort. When we use phrases like there is, or there are, or it is, and it was, you could take those out of your language and again, not lose any of the meaning that was already there. For instance, you could say, there are five reasons why something is such and such. And then you start getting into those five reasons. But you don't need it. You could, you could just say, you know, the first reason that this is so important is, the second reason I think this is a really important thing is, three, four, and five, okay? And I didn't need to have the, there is, there are. So in general, what, you can, what theme or what idea do you guys see running through these three bullets so far? If you were to, if you were to condense this and say, there is one rule of thumb here, what would it be? Make it simple. Yeah. Yeah, make direct. it simple. Sorry? Direct. Direct, to the point, simple. You guys have heard about KISS, right? Keep it simple, stupid. The idea is, again, from the company's perspective, don't waste time, don't waste the company's money. Be efficient in how you write, okay? Redundancies. What does it mean to be redundant? Say something over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Unnecessary. You've made the point. Don't beat it to death. Or empty words. They're like empty calories. When we talk about empty calories, are those calories that you're consuming, are they adding to the nutrition of your day? Like a Twinkie or a candy bar or something? Did that add, was your body able to use that food in any constructive way to build muscle mass? No, no. Heck, heck no, right? There, so think about empty words like empty calories. They're words that don't add anything. So I could go back and look at flabby expressions or long lead-ins or there is, there are, or redundancies and say, these are all different kinds of examples of empty words. Now, sometimes what I've noticed is that when people are not really sure of what their message is, they have a really hard time communicating it. They're just sort of filling space because they're they know they're supposed to communicate something, but they haven't sat through the situation long enough to come up with something quality to write. So they've thrown in all these flabby expressions and something and something and something else, just really ultimately garbage because it fills a page. But when you're going to work for a company someplace, you're actually paid. You're a knowledge worker. You're not a doer. You're really meant to be, number one, a thinker because you're a manager. And also, you have to do the work, too, okay? Because they've removed management layers in companies over the last 20 plus years. So the first step in this three by three matrix is to sit down and decide what your message is. And once you have a really crystal clear idea of what that is, then when we're drafting and when we're going back to this third phase and revisions and rewrites and editing and all that, what we're trying to do in, in, these, in that last phase especially is to make it as concise and perfect without any added crud in it as we can, okay? Questions, you guys? 
Guess not. Okay. Condensing for microblogging. When, when, this is a, what do you suppose a microblog is? Well, what is a blog in the first place? Do you know what, have you ever heard of a blog? Yeah, it's what? like a website where like people like put stuff and postings and like give them helpful hints and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Old internet. Yeah, it's on the internet. And so old people, internet. Say that again. Uh, old internet. Uh, not old. No, they're current. People do this a lot today. Mm -hmm. Companies blog when they're trying to share information with potential customers that they believe is going to help them establish credibility with those customers, provide new information that those customers need to make buying decisions. So you're trying to inform, you're trying to educate, you're trying to entertain sometimes. Overall, you're trying to create a relationship. That's a blog. But when we get to micro blogging, that's just a really fancy word for creating a post in social media, maybe three to five sentences or something. Well, if you've got a message and you've only got a short amount of space to write that message, you know you have to be very, very specific and particular about the way that you write it so that it's already condensed. You guys know what the word condensed means, yeah? Like if you ever, you, ever, you ever go to the grocery store and you look at the Campbell's soup and it says condensed soup on the can, does that ring a bell? Yes. Okay, so, so for, for anybody that doesn't know, when, you, when, I, when I open that can, and I throw it in the you know, saucepan to heat it up, I can't eat it like that because it's gonna be too rich. The manufacturer wants me to add water to it. That's okay, so the condensed is super concentrated. Um, um, and so what we're saying here is the same thing about the language that we're gonna write social media posts in. We want it to be super concentrated, okay? All right. So we've already talked about this pre-writing, drafting, and revising stage. This is just a review. When we're in this phase, which is what we're talking about tonight, we're talking about making what we've written better, more informative, more clear, more concise. And we're also looking at the sentence structure. What is, what does sentence, what is sentence structure? What does Sub that mean? Subject, verb, and um, noun or something like that. Yeah, every sentence is gonna have that. Um, a couple weeks ago when we talked about sentences and the different kinds of sentences, we looked at simple sentences, compound, um, compound complex. Remember that discussion we had? The different kinds of sentences. Those are different kinds of structures, okay? So what you're doing while you're revising is you're looking at the writing style that you used. And you're saying, can I make this document better? Can I make it more interesting to read? Can I make it easier for people to extract the information that they need from it? Those are all really important things. That's revising. Now, when we get to proofreading, which is also part of this third phase, we're taking a look at the grammar that we used in our writing. Last week, we looked at some examples of bad grammar. We, we talked about sentence fragments. We talked about comma splices. We talked about run-on sentences. You remember those examples we looked at? Those were all examples of incorrect grammar. So you're gonna to wanna to go through your document and find all those problems and correct them in your final draft. But you're also looking at things like spelling. Now, now because Microsoft Word has that super easy spell check system in it, a lot of people just think, well, I'll just run my, you know, I'll just run that software have it find all the mistakes and call it a day. 
the problem with that is that English in particular is a pretty tricky language. If I, I might misspell the word read, first of all, if I say read, how do you spell that word you guys read? How, how would you spell that? It's, it's, this is sort of- R-E-A-D. Oh, I was thinking about the word R-E-E-D. Hmm. So, so Microsoft Word won't be able to tell which version of that read word you wanted to use. And the spelling is correct both ways. And maybe you've got, you know, R-E-A, but it was a typo when you actually meant R-E-E. The reader is going to find the error when they, when they read your document. But it's up to you in this proofreading phase to find it before your audience does. So you can't just rely on spell check. You have to use your noggin, okay? Punctuation is the same thing. Formatting, we'll talk a lot about formatting as we go through this course, but formatting would be, there's a format for a letter. There's a format for an email. There's a format for a report in the way that we lay things out. Well, understanding what those formats are and making sure that the documents that you are writing are consistent with the expectations for any particular document style is part of the proofreading also, okay? Now there's another uh, bullet coming up here. Revising takes the most time in the writing process. And we've talked about this two weeks running. Let me ask you guys the question again. I've got three phases here. I've got pre-writing, drafting, and revising. If I have 100% of my time is pre-writing plus drafting plus revising, how much of my 100% actually comes from this third phase, revising? 50%? Yes, you nailed it. Way to go. Okay. So you're going to so that means that if you um, if you don't do this last step, it's the most important step, and you're you're probably not turning in your best work. Because a lot of us creating a reputation in the companies that we work for relies on what other people see of our work, you in your professional life can't afford to screw up like that. When you turn something in or publish it for the rest of the organization to see, and it's riddled with problems, people are gonna snicker and think not too much of you, which you can't afford to have in your career. Because when that happens, you're kind of volunteering to be at the back of the line for promotions that are coming up in the future. Or you might even be volunteering to be let go if things get slow in the company. Because you're not very valuable because you don't do very good work. Sorry, that's just the way it is, you guys. So it's important that what we create, that what we learn to create is consistently our very best effort. Don't turn in your first draft in this class, okay? Don't, um, don't try to, you know, uh, shortcut the process because in here it's a nice safe environment for you guys to learn what's expected of you when you go to work in a few years. That's what the whole point of this class is, is this is practice for the day after we graduate and after go to work, okay? And what I'm really wanting for you guys is to when you hit the ground, you hit the ground running, okay? So let's look at flabby expressions for a second. Here's an expression. It says, at this point in time, what could be a much more concise way to say at this point in time? Now. Now, absolutely. Do you see, now do you begin to understand what I mean by flabby? It, you, it could have been done in three letters, but this guy took five words and it didn't change the meaning of that at all. Didn't help one bit. Due to the fact that What's a better way to do that? Because of? Because. Good job. 
I've also got in very few cases. What's another way? What's an alternative? Sometimes. Also. Seldom or sometimes. Awesome. How did we get at awesome? Did you misunderstand what this meant over here? I, I want to know so I can help you with that. That's okay. We'll let it go. Despite the fact that. But. Although. This, I mean, the sentence could be, despite the fact that it rained on Saturday, they still held the parade. Okay. But I could have said, although it rained on Saturday, they still held the parade. So I can get rid of a bunch of words here and in my writing at work, be very efficient in how I'm writing it. What's another, what's a replacement for in the near future? Soon. Yeah, soon. So we're, so we're trying to do away with everything that falls in this column underneath flabby and replace it with things that are concise. So when you're reviewing your first draft, you want to look for things like this and you'd scratch out this kind of garbage and you'd replace it with stuff like this instead. That's part of the revision process. Okay, long lead ins. This is to let you know that Monday is a holiday. What's, what is a, how do I get, what was the lead in? Let me ask you first, what was the lead in to the main message in this sentence? This is to let you know. Yep, this is to let you know that. I could kill that and I've only got four words and I haven't changed the meaning of that sentence at all. I don't need that. It doesn't make it better. It actually makes it worse. This is the old saying about less is more. Okay. Here's one. I'm sending this email to announce that our internal audit begins on January 5. So what is the lead in? What, what can I, what can I chop and, and be better off? I am sending this email to announce. Yeah, to announce that. I don't need that word either. If I could, if I make the O a capital O and start the, the sentence with the word our, I'm in great shape. Our internal audit begins on January 5th. And that's excellent, okay? Less is more. But okay. can we also take up our and just say internal audit begins on January 5th instead? No, no, because um, internal audit is an incomplete sentence. Remember, a sentence is going to have a subject, a verb, an object. Yes. So the subject is us. <laughs> and our replaces the word us because it's possessive, right? Yes, got it. Okay, all right. We're gonna drop these unnecessary, there is, there are, and it, and it is, it was. Here's an example. There are at least 10 candidates who applied for that position. So, you know, what can I ask? What can I cut? Well, I would do it myself as just to say at least 10 candidates applied for that position. You can kill the word who also. It doesn't add anything here. Okay, so kill there are and who. At least 10 applicants apply for that position. Let's try another one. It was Becca Lopez who was finally selected. So, so what do I change? How do I make it better? Becca Lopez was finally selected. Yeah. Good job, Marcellus. Yep. So, you know, it was who relates or belongs with it was. 
it was somebody who. So if I take it was away, I also have to take who away. That's why you get rid of it. And just like you said, Marcellus, Becca Lopez was finally selected. Okay. Redundancies. Okay. Like repetitively repeating yourself. <laughs> okay. Combined together. Why, why is combined and together an example of being redundant or repetitive? It's the same. It means the same thing. It does. It means exactly the same thing. If something is combined with something else, aren't those two things already together? Yes. Of they are. So either combined or together is fine, but not both. You hear this a lot. You know, that was the exact same thing that John said. Well, look, if it's the same thing, I mean, if it's truly the same, then it's exact, isn't it? Be be just by the very virtue of being the same. If there's two twins that are identical, genetically, DNA, perfectly, exactly the same, at least anatomically, at least physically, aren't they exact copies of each other? For sure, they're the <laughs> same. So one or the other. Somebody explain this one. Why is that redundant? My personal opinion. It's my and personal art. Well, if it's your opinion, is it's it already my, my opinion. Yeah. Of course. It, you can't have somebody else's opinion, can you? No. No, if it's not if it's your opinion. <laughs> okay, here's another one. Refer back. Why is that one redundant? Because if you're referring to something, aren't you referencing something already? If you're referring, isn't it something else? This back represents the idea of something else, right? I'm referring you to someone else, or I have a reference in my letter to some other document. So this refer back is redundant. You, you get what I'm saying? Yes. Is everybody there? Yeah. Okay. Empty calories, right? Flabby words. This person got flat. That sentence got flabby because it ate too many calories, too many useless words. So here's empty words. In the case of General Motors, the car company was reorganized. Look, don't we already know? Doesn't everybody on the face of the earth know that General Motors is a car company? I mean, my God, it's right in the name of the company, right? General <laughs> Motors. So I don't need to say, Gen you know, General Motors, the car company, because that's sort of like, well, no shit, Sherlock. And, if, and I don't need to say in the case of General Motors, because it's obvious we've been talking about General Motors for a while here. I don't, you don't need to tell me, remind me what we're talking about. I, I don't have Alzheimer's or dementia yet. Okay. So another way to do this is General Motors was reorganized and that says all it needs to say. Here's another one. We are aware of the fact that well, if it's something that we're aware of, isn't it clear that it must be a fact? I mean, you're certainly not aware of some creative, you know, concept that only one person in the room has, unless you're somehow a mind reader, fortune teller, right? But if it's a fact, certainly there are, we are aware of it. It is a fact. So we are aware of the fact that many managers need assistance. Look, the whole point of the sentence is that many managers need assistance. I can get rid of we're aware of the fact that because it's not added anything. It's, it's an empty calorie. This is the English version of a Snickers bar, as much as I like Snickers bars, okay? I don't care how many peanuts it has in it. Okay, so we know, 
that many managers need assistance. We're aware, we know, whatever. When it arrived, I deposited your check immediately. Well, it would have been really difficult to deposit the check before it arrived. Have you ever been able to cash a check that you haven't received yet? No. <laughs> no. I mean, I don't know anybody that can do If you can do that, then I think you should go out and deposit $10 million this evening. Okay. Just with I all think that's called scamming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Bob. Yes, it is. All right. So I deposited your check immediately. So a lot of these things, you just have to look at them and think, if I were to take this sentence literally, like when it arrived, I deposited your check immediately. Well, what if I could, is it possible that I could do it any other way? No. So if it's not, then do I really need when it arrived? No. So it's really just more about thinking about what it is that you're writing and saying, look, besides me, is this going to make sense to anybody else here? Okay, improving clarity in business. But how do we improve the clarity of our language? First of all, before you answer this, tell me what you guys think I mean by clarity. Clear. Clear. So, so how can we improve the clearness in our business writing is essentially what this is. Keep the ideas simple. I like to think of it like this. If you're having a hard time expressing your idea, the chances are you haven't thought that idea through enough yet and you yourself are not exactly sure what it is you're trying to say. Does that make sense? Have you ever found, it's kind of like that, I'm talking and I can't shut up. <laughs> like I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> All of a sudden you find your mouth moving because you know you think you're supposed to say something but you're not really sure exactly what to say. So blah, 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 blah. You ever been there? Or have you ever seen anybody else in that position? Yes. Pretty Been there, done that. <laughs> Been there, done that. I think if we all tell the truth, at least one time in our lives, we have all been there, done that. Okay. Dumping trite business phrases. We'll look at this thing, trite business phrases, in a minute. Dropping cliches. We'll also look at this in a second. We'll find out what these things mean. Avoiding slang and buzzwords. What is the problem using slang in a business setting? What are some problems that you guys can think of why we shouldn't use slang? Somebody don't understand. Yes, exactly. And uh, Zoe, I'm thinking that you're saying that because you're coming to the English language as a second language and people are, tell me this if I'm right, do people yes. use slang and you sit there half the time going, I have no idea what they mean by that. Yeah, special for comedy show, I never understand. Yeah, because it's highly cultural and very contextual. And if you weren't, you know, raised in this cult, just as like as if I was, if I even spoke Chinese, just as, you know, if I were in China and you guys were speaking, I would be totally lost because it takes a lifetime of being in a culture to really get all the nuances of what that means, doesn't it? So in business, we want to make sure that everybody that we're speaking with understands exactly what we mean. We don't want to speak in a language that people don't understand because, well, let me, let me give you an example of that. Um, my grandmother uh, was born and lived most of her adult life until she was about 60 in Argentina. And then, you know, her daughters married and came to the United States and she followed them. She was a widow already by that point. She never was able to learn English. She was a really talented seamstress and a really great person, but she never had an education past the fourth grade in Argentina. So learning a foreign language was just beyond her skill set. Okay. So she lived most of her life here in this country, in this culture, feeling shut out most of the time. It's a really sad way to live your life, don't you think? When we use slang at work, 
or buzzwords, meaning industry words or words that only pertain to our profession. Like if you're an engineer, there's a bunch of words that engineers understand because it's part of the career. Same thing with marketing. Same thing, I guess, with medicine and lots of other things you guys can think of. But if they start talking in doctor speak around a table and you're at that table and somebody starts talking about a myocardial infarct, do you guys know what a myocardial infarct is? I'm going to guess no. That's, that's Dr. E's for a heart attack. Oh, wow. So, so if they had said heart attack, you would have been right there in the conversation, at least for that part of it. But they are using buzzwords, and so you're shut out. In business, we need to communicate in a way where everybody is on the same page. Okay? So we avoid slang and buzzwords. Rescuing buried verbs is another example. So this, these are sentences where the verb has been changed, so it's not a verb anymore. There are words in English called gerunds. You ever heard of that gerund, G-E-R-U-N-D? Maybe you guys remember it from English class in high school or something. A gerund is when you take an, a verb and you turn it into a noun. We'll look at examples like that, but these are buried. So it makes it the sentence hard to understand sometimes. Controlling your excitement, exuberance, excitement. We don't want to sound like 13 year old girls when we write a business document, right? This is not Hello Kitty time. This is you're at work in your career now, okay? So get rid of the hundreds of exclamation points or their, you know, and the words really, you know, truly, um, you know, awfully, anything that's like an adverb like that. It makes you sound um, immature and less than the full on professional that you are, okay? Choosing precise words. So an example of this would be, you know, hey, Paul, could you go into the garage and get that thing for me and bring it in here? Now, unless Paul and I were having an earlier conversation today, specifically about some object that's in the garage, and he can intuit what I mean by that. Can you go get that thing and bring it in here for me? He's going to look at me like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Because the word that I used, thing, to represent crescent wrench is not precise. Okay, let's go back. Keep it short and simple. It would not be inadvisable for you to affix your signature at this point in time. Do any of you guys understand what that sentence is trying to say? No. It would not be inadvisable. Well, first of all, from a grammatic perspective, that's a double negative. And which is okay if you're, you know, um, Mick Jagger and you're singing, I ain't got no satisfaction two negatives, but nowhere, nowhere else is it okay to do that, all right? So it would not be inadvisable as a double negative. Now, do you guys remember your math back in high school or maybe in college where you had the negative of a negative number? Yes, become positive. It becomes positive. So it would not be inadvisable, probably means it would be a good idea. Well, then why didn't you just freaking say that, <laughs> right? For you to affix, what does the word affix mean? Anybody? It means to, to place, to stick, okay? Your signature, okay, that's the word we understood. At this point in time, we saw this example a little while ago. What's a better way to say at this point in time? No. Yeah. So. How could I say this sentence that I've just broken down for you in a nice, simple, keep it short and simple or keep it simple, stupid kind of approach? Anybody got a guess? 
No wrong answers. Could it be like don't sign or something like that? Not not don't sign. Uh, it would be advisable to attach your signature. Well, no? a fix is a fix is sort of a fifty cent word, but I got a limited budget. I don't need to use such a difficult word. Hmm. Now we know that it's not. We know that it's not don't because that's it's just a double negative, meaning it's really means do, right? Attach your signature now. Yes. Well, what if we said, please sign this now? Please sign this now. Four words. Instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen words. Sixteen words that I used when I could have just used four. Flabby, right? Empty words, right? Waste yes. of time, right? You should sign now. Again, four more words. Here are implements that are necessary for the job to be completed in a satisfactory manner. What is an implement? It's tool. a tool. It's a tool. So here are tools that are necessary for the job to be completed in a satisfactory manner. How can we say that in a far fewer words so that everybody in the room understands what it is you're trying to say? Here's a manual for your job. This is the right tool for the job. Here are tools to do the job satisfactorily. They both mean about the same thing, right? Here's the right tool for the job. And this word satisfactorily is kind of a big word. You could use it. Most people would understand it. There might be some people who don't. Can you improve on this so that everybody gets it? Sure. And that's what we're trying to do is always make sure that you say things. Do you guys remember when you looked at fractions and math and there was always some called something called the lowest common denominator. Paul remembers this because he's a good math guy. I can never remember my own phone number. <laughs> I'm bad at math. <laughs> okay. Well, so, so the lowest common denominator meant that, look, I had one fraction that said one eighth or two eighths. And I had one fraction that said four sixteenths. And I had another fraction that said one fourth the lowest common denominator would have been one fourth. Because if it's four sixteenths, it's still one fourth. And if it's two eighths, it's still one fourth. And if it's one fourth, it's still one fourth. So what I'm trying to tell you is think about the average Joe in that business that you need to communicate with. What words can you use that no matter how they look, who they are in the company, they're gonna be able to figure out what you mean. How do you come up with an equivalent way to say something so that it works everywhere? Okay, trite. That's one of those uh, uh, examples we looked at a minute ago. So trite, pursuant to your request. This is something that is a phrase that you might hear in certain circles from time to time in certain situations, pursuant to your request, but it's trite, meaning uh, it's unnecessary to say it that way. Isn't there a better way to say it? How would you say pursuant to your request? What's, what's better than pursuant to? Per? Per, totally right, Christina. Yep, per. Or, well, this, so I would say per your request, or you could say as you requested, but either way, it means the same thing. There's, ob there's obviously options, right? Please do not hesitate to. Well, if I've said please, and I'm saying, and hesitation means you're not going to do something, 
You're going to hesitate. You're going to wait. And I'm saying, don't wait. How can I, how can I say this? Please in the few words, huh? Please do. Yeah, or just please. We, we already assume that the word do is, is included in what you're saying. It's one of those words that we, in English, we understand it's there. Maybe there's examples like that in Chinese too, where you don't have to say a particular word because the word that precedes it already carries the same information. Do you guys have that in Chinese? Chinese have to, to have something to like a peace, ways, peace. Otherwise, don't understand, only peace. Uh, okay, all right. Well, in English, we don't, okay? So, so in please, if I say please, you're expecting me to, like, let's say that we're, that like, you know, we're both at a doorway. Now we obviously can't get through that doorway at the same time, because it's only big enough for one person to go. So you kind of extend your hand towards the door and you go, please. What is meant by that gesture and me using the word please? What am I saying? I'm basically saying, you know, please proceed, right? I'll let you go first, right? So in English, we can just say please and people understand what it is that you mean. Okay. With reference to, what's, an, what's, a, what's a real simple way to get around that idea? With reference to. About. Um, Who? About, nice. And closed, please find. Again, this, these are all examples of trite phrases. So we used to use some of these things a lot in English. Like, and look, if you're sending an email and you use, and you wanna let somebody know that in addition to, you know, the email that they're reading on their screen, you've attached a report or something else, but you say, in closed, please find. It's sort of um, misleading because there's, we got enclosed, please find, because that was back in the day when people had paper envelopes that you would, you know, lick and shut. So when, the, when you said please, in, you know, or enclosed, please find, what you were saying was, hey, don't forget to look in the envelope, dummy, because, you know, you're going to leave something out and that's important that's still in there. Okay, enclosed, please find. But it's trite now because it's lost its meaning, because hardly anybody sends anything snail mail anymore. There's some slang, snail mail. Zoe, do, do you know that term? Snails move really slow, especially in comparison to an email that can go at the speed of light. All I have to do is hit send and you've already got it. Versus a um, snail mail where I have to put a stamp on it, take it to the post office, drop it in the box, somebody else has to get it and take it out. Then they have to put it in a truck and it has to go on a carrier route and it eventually gets delivered to you four or five days later. That's why it's snail, it's slow, okay? So we say snail mail, is it slang? But it's an example, you guys, of how when you use slang, you're not including everybody that you need to communicate with. Zoe didn't get that. And it's my job as a communicator in this class environment to make sure that Zoe understands everything that we're talking about. So I'm going to avoid slang, okay? So in close, please find, how can I say this better? Like enclosed, it is something? Uh, yeah. Uh, enclosed. Uh, so you could say um, enclosed, um, but it, we're likely, likely we're not um, uh, uh, sending this through the mail because nobody uses that anymore, or very few people use it anymore. So we're not really enclosing it. So we want to get around that word. What else can we do? Attach it. Attached. Could be attached. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. Find attachment. Well, they used enclosed again. I would have not done that. 
But maybe in this example, we actually are sending something through the mail. If you really are, and it really is in an envelope, then you should say enclosed is, okay? Cliches and slang and buzzwords. Okay, this is an example of a cliche. Last but not least, you guys have all heard that phrase before, last but not least. We don't need to say that anymore, right? I mean, no one thinks that just because you were at the end of a, you know, of a list of things, we think less of you. It's just how it goes. So I can completely get rid of that. It's a cliche. And I could just say, we must cut costs. But even cut is kind of a weird word because do we actually take a scissors or a knife to our costs and actually cut it? That's sort of slang too, isn't it? What do we really mean in this sentence? To reduce costs? Yeah, we must reduce costs. Because again, somebody who's not from here, hasn't grown up, hasn't ever heard that phrase before, they're actually gonna literally think, what does that mean to cut a cost? Maybe to get out the $100 bills and start cutting them all in half. That'd be dumb. So finally, we must, and again, I don't like what they've done here in the book, but I would say we must reduce costs. How about this? Hey, prof, what you think of my killer paper? What's wrong with that? Well, what's right with that? <laughs> what do you think, you guys? How should that be stated in a better way? With the U, it should have been like, instead of that, it should have been like Y-O-U, you know? Well, that's one thing. Yeah. And it that... would have been like, hello, professor, or something like that. Yeah, sure. What else? If I, if I, what is a prof? Professor. 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 You. Yeah. And what do you think? Does that sound a little bit disrespectful? Yeah, it seems a bit impolite. Hey, hey, homeboy, what you think about this killer paper? That's no good. That is not, not good, okay? So how can we state this in a way that's more appropriate for the audience? If you're speaking to, I don't care if you do it with me, guys, okay? I'm your pal in here. But if you're talking to, you know, a, a, a major professor, you know, at Yale or Stanford or Harvard or whatever, would you ever approach that guy with all his hundreds of degrees and big standing and a big important university and never say that? Probably not. So what do you do? Like, hey, um, hello, professor. Do you like my essay or something like that? That's good. Yeah. Now, the writers of the book, they say, Professor, what did you think of my paper? And there's lots of other options that you could have used for that, right? Professor, do you have any critique about my paper? I mean, that, that, that's, you know, not, not necessary, but there's another, you know, another approach to it. Our point man will ping our repurposed proposal to you. Ping. So we're playing ping pong here? What do you mean ping? Is this an Atari game? What are we doing? I don't get that. So, so our point man, what is he like really sharp and pointy? He's like a cone head from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> what? I don't get that. So what's better than this? Sansa will send you, send the proposal to you. What is meant by the term point man though? He's using this term for something. Do you guys know this term? Main contact. Main contact, group leader, you Main know, member. Yeah. something, right? This guy is a, he's probably the group leader or team leader or something, right? So you could say instead of this and repurpose, which if you're writing a proposal to somebody, would you ever tell them 
that it's repurposed. Hey, you know what? We wrote this for another company, but then we just slap your name on it instead and we're giving it to you too. That's kind of what the idea I get when I hear that. Doesn't that make you as the prospective customer feel all kinds of special? No. No, heck no. So what's better? Our leader will send you the proposal to you. Sure. I think that sounds good. Or even we're going to be specific. So, you know, this guy, this customer has met the whole team by now. He knows Jake and he knows Freddie and he knows Zane and he knows Alexandria. Those are the four people on our team. Well, I want you, Mr. Customer, to know who's going to send it to you. Jake is going to send it to you. And it's a revised proposal, meaning hey, we've already gone one round in this contract negotiation with you. And you had some things you didn't like about that contract. So we've made changes. We revised it. We didn't repurpose it. We revised it. You guys kind of get in the flow of what we're doing as we're, you know, reading a first, remember what are we doing? These are all things that after we've read our first draft, just to kind of bring us back to the beginning, we've read our first draft and now we're finding all kinds of funky things in our document. When we take a second, a third read, whatever, these things pop up and we say, I got to replace that. I got to make that better. And that's, these are all examples of things that we need to replace and make better. Buried verbs, verbs that are needlessly converted to wordy noun expressions. They call those gerunds. I would like you to give consideration to, give consideration. So we've added a verb now, give. This is like an object, right? John gave consideration. It's kind of like John ate the ice cream. Okay, well, couldn't you just be just as fine to say, please consider? You don't need to give consideration. Just consider, use the verb, unbury it, make it clear what you want somebody. Remember what a verb is, it's an action word. It's about doing. So if you'd want somebody to actively think about it, then yeah, use the word consider since that's the same thing. Here's another one, this guy, this time you guys fix it. Reach a conclusion. What should the verb be in that phrase? The verb that's in the phrase or come up with well, well, the verb that's in the phrase is reach, yeah. to reach, but what, but, but, but the in conclusion, well, conclusion is not a, is not a verb. No. Conclude. Make it a verb. Conclude. Yes. So ah. reach a conclusion is um, a flabby way to say conclude. Finish it up, dude. Conclude it. Okay. So here's another one. Create a reduction in. What should the verb actually be? Reduce? Yes, to reduce. I reduce, you reduce, she reduces. In English, we conjugate verbs differently than almost every other language. Okay. Create a reduction. I don't need that. I can just go with the word you guys have already suggested. Reduce. Where's the verb? Decide. Yes. <clears throat> What's the verb? Action. Not action, no. Action is a noun. Act. Act, act. to act. So what we wanna do again is be really clear in our writing, clear and simple not give consideration to God with a lot of gas. Just use the word consider. Act. 
Okay. Remember, this is the part where we are not 13 year old girls here and this is not Hello Kitty territory. So we want to control our excitement instead of, you know, coming off like that super excited, you know, seventh grader, <laughs> okay? So excessive exuberance. We are actually very certain that they totally agree with our proposal. Oh boy, I'm gonna jump up and down and be all excited about this. See how dumb that sounds? What's better? What's more business-like? They agree with our proposal. Yeah. We are certain that they agree with our proposal. I don't need to say actually, I don't need to say totally, it didn't add anything. I don't need to say very, these are just empty words. Jake, here's Jake again. Jake was really extremely sorry that he completely forgot the meeting. Oh my gosh, gag me with a spoon. Jake, okay, so what is the real way to do this that you would feel proud to say in business and you wouldn't be asked to leave the playground? Jake forgot his meeting. Yeah. Or J Jake was sorry that he forgot the meeting. He wasn't really extremely sorry. If Jake is sorry and he says he's sorry, does that mean that he feels any better than if he was really extremely sorry? Do I really need to say he was really extremely sorry? I suppose there could be grades or, you know, um, a range of sorriness. Like I'm only a little bit sorry versus I'm a lot sorry. Who cares? Get on with it. Okay, precise meaning, less precise. He said that he thought they should help out with the report. Well, okay, I just stepped into the room and you gave me the sentence. I got no context for what you're saying. I really, when I've heard this, I have no idea on earth what you really are trying to tell me. I don't know who he is. I don't know who they are. I don't really know what you mean by help out and what report. This is useless. This is not communication at all. This is the team leader, that's who he is, told Jason, that's the other he, and Chris, oh, that's what he means by they, Jason and Chris, that they should not help out, they should write sections of the report. If you wanted to be just a little bit more specific, you could say of the third quarter profit report. More specificity is always better, okay? So that's an example, now you. They called with a change in the meeting. Well, let's look at it. Our client, somebody, and instead of they, X, Y, Z called to reschedule, not a change, it was a reschedule. I mean, change means we're gonna have it in a different city or in a, you know, or on a different floor of the building or for a, the meeting is for a different purpose. Or, I mean, I can come up with thousands of things that change could mean. But all he wanted to say was they're just gonna reschedule it for two days in the future. But this, this is confusing. It doesn't really help the situation. And it's a waste, it's a waste, it's, it doesn't help. You guys with me on this? Yes. All right, enhancing readability by optimizing document design. So when this is having to do with that word we heard earlier today about format okay when we format a document it means that we're doing things with the document that make the document easier to understand and interpret if you're the reader because the way that we lay things out can either make something more hard to read and understand or easier to understand and we want to do everything we can to make our communication efficient meaning everyone can understand it okay so white space, and we'll see examples of all this in a few minutes. White space, margins, typefaces, fonts, numbered and bulleted lists, and headings. These are all things that we can use in our writing that will help improve the reader's ability to interpret and understand. 
white space. So let me see if I can, so, you know, look at this. These rectangles here represent paragraphs of text. But if you look all around the edges here and at the top, it's been left white. They do this because having a lot of white space instead of a lot of really condensed writing and it's basically like this black page allows the reader to relax a little bit. It's a more pleasant document to look at and people don't feel so stressed trying to read through this really dense document, okay? And that's just, just a simple psychological thing that we do to make your reader more receptive to the message that you're trying to deliver. If people are all uptight because of the way that you delivered something, the way it looks, your ability to get your message over is not gonna be anywhere near as easily achieved as it is if you do things to make it easier. So we can add headings. A heading could be, let me, see, let me see if I can find you a real document here on my computer, see what I come up with. I'd like to show you something real. Trying to open this. Okay, so this is actually, we talked about blogs earlier. This is a blog that I wrote for one of my clients recently. This is the title for the document. Now, now look at all of the white space around this page, right? There is everything here, this whole wide white area. There's the space between the paragraphs, meaning it's not all run together, right? There's some space between you know, the, the words. Now, if I was gonna, uh, you don't really see a lot of um, headings in here yet, but if I were to start adding headings, I might do it like this. So that still looks like the title, but if I were to make it smaller, because this is all by itself and it's bold and it looks different than the rest of the text, it's already a visual cue that, hey, the information that follows is about this particular topic. Now let's say that I wanted to take that and divide this paragraph into subsections of the paragraph. Well, I could do this and I could italicize it. And if I could also maybe make it a little smaller. So now you've got a title across the top of the page. This says that the information that follows anywhere until the next one of these is all about one particular topic. And this tells you that the information that falls underneath here is a subsection of this big idea here. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you visual cues about the outline of my document. I'm kind of, it's like, it's like the same way that they write textbooks, okay? They do that so that you understand the flow of the chapter and what is a main section of the chapter and a main idea, and what are supporting sections underneath any particular main idea. It's all directional. It's giving you a sense of the way the writer understands the information and how he perceives the whole topic and what he's delivering and his organization to what he wrote. Are you with me on that? So we're using these, um, these headers or subheads, subsections, or sections and subsections as ways to divide our paper up. Are you guys with me? Yes. Okay. Headings. We could do bulleted or numbered lists. Let me go back to this now. I'm just playing with the way it's laid out so it works for my example, okay? All right, let's say that this whole section in here has, you know, is like a list. 
I'm talking about methods of transportation. So I'm talking about cars and buses and trucks and planes and motorcycles and bicycles and skateboards and scooters and whatever. But it's all jumbled up in this really heavy paragraph and it's hard to find, it's hard to pull the, it's hard to pull the information out the way it's laid out. But if I do this, oh look, there's four ideas that the writer wants me to take away from here. This is about trucks, this is about, you know, uh, automobiles, this is about motorcycles, this is about scooters, okay? And so I can see, oh, one idea, second idea, third idea, fourth idea. And so right away, you're given a cue or a suggestion that says, there's four things that I need to get out of this paragraph. And you know that because it was provided to you because the rotor, the rotor, the writer was using bullets. Now, let's say that the order of presentation is important. Let's say that this was a paragraph originally that didn't have any of these marks, uh, none, okay? This is a recipe. First you open, you know, first you put the flour in the mixing bowl and then you add the, you know, the cocoa and then you add the sugar and then you crack the eggs and you put those in and then you add the vanilla and then you add a little bit of milk and then you stir it all up and then you put it in a baking tin and then you put it in the oven at 350 degrees. There is a really important order to the way that we follow this recipe. Because if I started by cracking, you know, if, by, by putting the milk in the bowl and then I go to stir it up, right? Like that, Cause I didn't put it in order. And then I say, okay, you know, now turn on the oven to 350, but I haven't added any of the powdered ingredients. Do I have a cake? No, I don't have anything, I have a mess. Because the order in which we do things is super important to the way that the project lays out. So if I use numbers here, people understand it to say, okay, the first thing you have to do is this. And when you've completed it, then you go to step two, which is such and such. And then you go to step three, which is so and so. And then finally you do this. I get it. Now I know what to do and in what order to do it. Now, if, if it was the same information, but I didn't give you it in, in numbers, I just gave it to you in bullets, you, you're not sure if I've provided these instructions in any particular order, is it just random? Like, you know, when we talked about cars and trucks and, you know, motorcycles and scooters, it just as easily could have been scooters and trucks and cars and motorcycles, couldn't it? The order didn't matter. But in my baking example, it does matter or I have a disaster, I don't have a cake. Questions? Are you guys all cool with that? Okay, I'm gonna. Okay. All right. I figured you would be. Using short sentences. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the fact that the longer a sentence goes, the more the comprehension, the reader's understanding of that sentence trails off. And I said, the book says, that if you write a sentence that's about eight words long, you're gonna have about 95% of the people who read that sentence understand it. But as I start getting longer and longer and longer sentences, understanding that sentence just falls totally apart. I don't get it anymore, no good, okay? So we wanna to try to write in short sentences. We also want to write in short paragraphs because just like the length of a sentence, you know, when you write in long paragraphs, comprehension also trails off. People will start getting confused. They can't, they can't retain, sorry, they can't retain that much information at any one time. It's just not working for them. Okay. So keep it short. Uh, setting an effective margin. Let's go back to my real document here, okay? If I go to layout 
And um, I start looking at, is it in here? Is it in layout? Margins. I can make my margins anything I want them to be, right? So let's say that I'm gonna play with this. I'm gonna change my margins for a second. And I'm gonna make these, um, you know, 0.25 on the left, and which is a quarter of an inch and 0.25 on the right. Okay. Now, have, have I given you as much white space now in this version? No, it's almost edge to edge, right? I don't even wanna look at that document. That looks like a sea of words and it's gonna be really hard to read. I don't want that. But if I do go back and I say, okay, let's be more reasonable about this. And I say, okay, you know what? On my left, let's use one inch. And on my right, let's also use one inch. Oh, there's my white space. It's easier, it's more pleasant reading. It lowers the, it's psychological, okay? But it helps, everything helps in our communication, okay? So this is an easier, more pleasant document to work with. We can add headings, short sentences. Okay, dot, 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 all right. So we've uh, used one inch to one and a half inch margins. And this is how we do this. You guys may have known this already, but this is Word. I'm gonna look under here under layout and under layout, I'm looking at margins and in margins I have all kinds of crazy options that I can use. And that's how you set the margins in case you didn't know. Okay, so, so there, there it is, okay. Now, here's another thing. Go back to my example again. Do you see how the line down the right side of this page kind of weaves in and out? This line is shorter than this line, and this line gets a little bit shorter, and it's about the same length here, and then this one's shorter. This is really short. So the right edge is kind of you know going in and out, right? They call this a ragged edge. Ragged meaning it's not straight up and down. This is preferred. If I, I could do it another way, I could say, um, uh, where is it? How do I do it? Uh, da, 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 da. Well, I'll give you an example from the thing. This is the ragged. This is the other kind. This is what they call right justified, okay? It's not ragged. It's right, just meaning that it's justified. It's a straight up and down edge on this side and a straight up and down edge on this side. Now on this page, the writer has created two columns, which to me makes it even more difficult to look at. It's such a lot on one page. I'm getting dizzy just looking at it. And it's not broken up and there's no headings and there's no bullets and come on, work with me. Would you please make this, make my life a little bit easier, okay? So we don't want this. When we go with this instead, this ragged edge, it's giving us more white area of the page. This version here, there's not as much. Imagine that, you know, the page ends right next to that right edge, you know, next, you know, up and down from the word Bible through the word program. And on this side, pretty much, you know, after the what and down to the word named. And that's the whole page. Do I have any white space there? Certainly not. So that's a mess. I don't want to, I don't even want to look at that page. That looks like a lot of work. Over here, it doesn't look like there's that much there. So your audience has the stress or the pressure reduced. You're not asking them to clout, climb Mount Everest in order to understand your paper. You're saying, here's something easy to look at. You'll understand this. Go for it. Typefaces. There's two main kinds of typefaces. 
they call a typeface that looks like this, the one on the left, a sans serif typeface. The one over here, you know how it has these little extensions along the tops and the bottoms of the letters? This is called the serif typeface. These, these are French terms. Sans in French means without. And serif means tail. So these letters don't have these little tails that you see on this font here or this typeface here on the right. This sans serif typeface is great for headings in a document or to use when you are creating signs or material that doesn't require a lot of continuous reading. It's boom, it's one word, it's clear, it's easy. But the reason that we've attached these little hooks and tails and things to these letters, because it has a tendency to join the words together and to join, you know, so that instead of looking at a page of discrete words, word, 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 and none of it really feels like it flows, using these tails gives the overall document a sense that all these things flow together. This is gonna have a meaning to it. Whereas in the sans serif world, on the left again, I don't have that, but because I'm using it for a sign or something that requires just very limited reading or a heading, which is just a few words and not a paragraph full of words, sans serif is better. I don't need to create that sense of an overall flow, okay? Now, how big should the letters on our page be? When I, when I wrote this document here, this was my title for the document. This was a header and this was a subhead, okay? Everything underneath the title is considered the body of the document. When I'm writing text for the body of the document, it can be anywhere 10 to 12 points. I'm sure you guys know this, but like, how, what point size is this? This is 16 point. It's bigger than this, which is 12 point, right there where it ought to be. So if it's the title, you want something larger. If it's a heading, you still want it larger. I could have maybe gone 14 or something. Again, it's just another way to make this text look different than the body text. And I got smaller here because I wanted to communicate that this is a major point, but it's not as important as this point. So one way to communicate that would be to make the font size smaller and also to italicize it. You guys can come up with whatever rules you want when you do this. But a really important fact to keep in mind is once you start a plan in a document, you have to stay consistently with it. Your reader is going to pick up awfully quickly what style or convention or approach you're using in your document. And so he's learned it now. If you go on throughout the document and suddenly later on you change it up, uh-oh, he's confused now. I thought I understood the way this was laid out. I thought I got, you know, what this meant and what this meant. But all of a sudden, you, the writer, you're doing something different. Why did it change? Does it mean something different? Do I, you know, I'm, I'm confused. Now I'm trying to understand what it is that you actually wrote. I want to understand your message. But now I'm also trying to contend with, I don't even understand your layout or your organization in your paper anymore. So these are all cues that make it simpler, easier for people to understand where you're going, what your overall plan was for the document. I've shown you examples of capitalization and small caps, boldface we've seen, italics, underlining. Here, going back to that document again. Here was, I, I did this, increasing US and global resistance to Chinese trade. That was, a, that was a section or a concept 
that was different than almost everything else I had addressed so far. So my convention in the document that we actually published on the internet was to make the information in here stand out as special by creating that subhead or that header here that looks different than the rest of the text. Again, you can do it in any way you want, just have a plan and stick to it. Okay, whoops. We've talked about numbered lists and we've talked about bulleted lists. Did you guys have any questions about that from previously talking about it? No? Okay. Here's another important thing to keep in mind. We talk about parallel, parallel construction. If two lines are parallel, what does that actually mean? Are the lines ever going to cross? They don't cross because they're running exactly, exactly in the same direction. I could extend one line forever and extend the line that's next to it forever and they will never cross because they're exactly parallel. If they're not, even if just a little bit off, at some point these lines are going to cross. Keep that analogy in mind for now what I'm going to talk to you about. Here's a, here's a sentence. Keeping an old customer is much cheaper than to find a new one. I've got two forms of a verb. I've got the, I've got the, the ing form of a verb here, keeping. The, the standard form of the verb would say to keep. Now over here, I've got another verb. This time I didn't use the ing, I said to find. Well, a lot of readers are gonna get tripped up by that. One way that you can help them not get tripped up is by making sure that both of these verbs are in the same form. So I could say keeping an old customer is cheaper than finding a new one. Keeping and finding both have that same ing ending on the verb. They're parallel. Or it could say, to keep an old customer is cheaper than to find a new one. Again, now the, the form is also the same. And so for some people, it's going to be easier for them to understand what it is you're trying to communicate. Here's another one. To protect your pet from dog nappers, be a constant companion. Don't boast about the breed. You should keep photos handy. Which one of those three bullets is not properly it, uh, parallel? Which one of those needs to be redone? So the third one, yep. So I said be a constant don't boast. So this is basically do. This one is don't. And then this one, what do we do here? I don't need to use the words you should. Be something, don't do something, and keep photos. Be a companion. Okay. Be is the verb. And the object is companion. Don't is the verb and the object is breed. Okay. Keep and the object is photos. So I want to have verb, object, verb, object, verb, object in the parallel arrangement. Treat it exactly the same or people are going to trip on it. Okay. What kinds of headings can we have? Well, we can have a main heading, we can have a subhead, and we can have a category heading. Well, category headings look like this. The, the, you know, you've got this document and you've said the company needs to focus attention in three areas. Well, that's a tip off right away that you're gonna talk about three categories of, 
you know, focusing attention in those, where do we need to focus our attention? There's at least three places where we need to focus our attention. So they're categories. One of those places that we need to focus is attracting applicants. So we, what we've done here is we've made this bold and we immediately follow it up with the sentences that explain this category heading. Notice this isn't a sentence. It doesn't need to be a full sentence if it's um, a heading. So we've, we've also included it in the, with the rest of the text instead of putting it above, because again, it's a category heading. So attracting applicants, interviewing applicants, and checking references. Notice that these three are all also what? We talked about it on the previous slide. Parallel. Parallel. Yep. Nice, Elizabeth. Okay. So there's some problem areas with proofreading. And um, we want to approach these things the right way. I know in order to, especially when we're looking at documents that are more complicated. So what are the things that we want to watch for? Spelling. We talked about this earlier, right? And don't rely on spell check. If you're not sure of the spelling, obviously, what else besides spell check is there for us to use? A dictionary, right? Pull it out. You guys, you guys all have a dictionary, right? We do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So, you know, just pull it off the old shelf, old school. Okay. Grammar. So, you know, you got grammar and grandpa. No, I'm just kidding. Um, what, what is, <laughs> what is grammar? How the sentences are um, connected. Uh, yeah. Right, how exactly, do you have the punctuation right? Do you have the sentence construction right? Are you, you know, is everything perfect? Punctuation, commas and semicolons and colons and question marks and quotation marks and all those other things. By the way, just as a reminder, if you guys feel like you've got some weaknesses in your writing about any of this stuff, there are um, some there are some tools in Cengage. It's called the uh, a grammar. It's a grammar workshop. It's a whole section about grammar online in Cengage that you guys can go to and work on these things. Some diagnostic tests you can take and some tutorials that you should walk through and work on to you know strengthen areas that you think you need improvement in. Names and numbers. Why is it so important for us to make sure that we spell people's names correctly? Respect. Yeah, that's a huge piece, respect. Um, and numbers. In business, you guys are gonna be using numbers a lot. And, you know, the order, look, there's a, you guys ever heard of a, of a disease called dyslexia? It's a vision disease, it's a vision problem. Any of you guys have dyslexia? Dyslexia, for some reason, people see numbers or letters in a different order than the way they actually appear on the page. So if the number is 1357, what somebody might see is 1735. Their mind just does that, okay? So people with dyslexia, you might be trying to copy information over from one document to the other, and what you saw was 1735, but it should have been 1357. You need to find a way to catch those errors or you're misrepresenting something about the performance of the business. And they are relying on you guys to report what's happening accurately. So, I mean, that's what the business is all about is the numbers at the end of the day. So you have to be right and you have to, you'll have to come up with ways to do this. Um, right out of college, um, uh, a guy that I used to be very close friends with and I roomed together in this old house in Anaheim. And uh, he has since moved away. He lives now in, in uh, uh, North Carolina. 
but he actually he was an, he was a CPA. So but he had dyslexia is the point of my story. So he was constantly overcoming this problem and it is able to, you, people are able to overcome it. You just have to devise the right tactics that work for you to do it if any of you guys actually do have those. And then format. Okay, how can we get better at proofreading? What are some ways that we can go about doing this? Well, you can, let's, let's go back to my fake uh, example here, okay? Let's say that I am um, interested in, you know, improving this. Well, what I could do, let's see, can I, give me a second here, insert, shape, square, okay. I've just covered a bunch of this, right? What, why is this a good idea? Because how many lines of this text can you see right now? One, right? So as you're proofing this, being able to see only one line of the document forces you to look at every word instead of kind of getting, you know, all lost in all of this stuff, you're limiting your, your feet, you're limiting your field of vision on the document and you're taking your time with the proofreading. That's the key advantage here. Okay. So let's bring this up again. Okay. So there's my first sentence. It's beginning to seem like there is light at the end of the COVID-19 tunnel. Economic recovery is, huh, I don't see anything wrong there. I'm gonna keep going. The topic of conversation everywhere. It's almost like being at the horse track, comma, with people. Okay, go to the next one. Trying to separate the underdogs from the short. You see what I'm doing with you guys? I'm, I'm, I'm slowing myself down enough to do a very accurate, careful job of the proofreading. And all I had to do was create a little tool for myself, just put a square on the page that only lets me look at a little bit at a time. That's a super effective way to do this. I don't know if, tell me if you guys ever fall into this trap. When I write something, I know what I expect to have on the page. But, you know, if I get into a flow, you know, I might be writing something and I might have a typo or a grammatical error or something. But when I go back to proofread it, I'm expecting that there aren't any problems there. And what I, act, what I, what I think I see on the page is what my expectations are, not what's really there. So I have to slow myself down enough to see what is actually on the page, not what I assume is on the page. Do you guys know what, do you guys get what I'm saying? We see what we assume, we see what we want to see is what I'm really trying to say. And if you do this, you're forcing yourself to see what really is. Looking for typos, misspellings, and easily confused words. An example of that easily confused word that we used before was the word read. You spelled it R-E-A-D. But I was really talking about this bamboo type grass that grows in water. That's a reed. It's the wrong reed, not the one you were thinking of. Spell check doesn't know which one I, I mean. Spell check just knows what, and, you know, what words are in this dictionary and what words aren't. It's just a database, okay? Study the document for inconsistencies. Inconsistencies, one example of an inconsistency could be lack of parallel construction. I've got two, I, I've got two you know, examples of ing verbs followed by another verb, but it's in the wrong form. So it's an inconsistency that I need to go back and correct. Or ambiguous expressions. And what does the word ambigu uh, ambiguous mean? Do you guys know? If something is ambiguous, it means I don't really know what it means. Or the meaning is not clear to me. So if you've written something 
but the person that you give the document to is confused by what you've said, you should have written it better in the first place. I mean, if you, if you distribute a memo around the office and what you get back is 50 questions about what you released, you know that the problem is not them. They're not stupid. You didn't write it well. And it could be that there are mistakes, inconsistencies, expressions that are not clear. We talked tonight about clarity. We talked about getting rid of triteness. You know, we talked about using specific words. If we don't do those things, we have ambiguous or unclear expressions. Looking for factual errors. That dyslexia example I gave you where it should have said 1357, but you know, uh, me and my damn dyslexia, I wrote 1735. You have to find those errors. That's only one kind of an error. Another kind of an error, like a factual error was you're trying to schedule a meeting. You type that it's the meeting is supposed to be on Monday, the 24th of September. What's wrong with that? The only thing that's wrong with that is that Monday next week is the 23rd. That's another factual error. If you put something out that says Monday, the 24th of September, you're going to get a bunch of questions like, did you mean Tuesday? Or did you actually mean Monday the 23rd? I don't know. You wrote the 24th, Monday. I don't get it. Okay, so printing a copy that's preferably double spaced. This is another way to use that blue square idea I showed you a minute ago. If it's in writing and it's on your desk and you're not reading it off the screen, you can take another sheet of paper and lay it on top of the first one and pull it down, okay? It's the same sort of thing. I love this one. Set it aside and take a breather. What benefit are you getting as the writer by letting some time go between the time that you finish the draft and the time that you go to proofread it? What, what advantage do you think you gain? Fresh mind, you reset your mind. Nice, Christina. Right on. On target. So since you've reset your mind, you're looking at it more objectively you're going to be much more receptive to seeing these mistakes because you don't have printed in your imagination what's supposed to be there okay you're also going to be in a lot better position to be able to hear things like tone of voice let's say that you wrote this thing but while you were writing it you were pretty pissed off about something and that edginess in the way that you're feeling emotionally right now leaks out onto the paper and you, you couldn't help but leak it out. That's the frame of mind that you were in when you wrote this thing. Does your audience deserve to get a document that sounds kind of snarky? Is sounding snarky gonna help your position with those people? So taking a breather, maybe 24 hours between what you wrote and now what you actually know you sounded like gives you the time to cool off so that you can hear all the funkiness in the way you were saying things and you can fix it before you offend somebody. Allow yourself adequate time for careful proofing. Remember, this third phase is supposed to be 50% of the time that you're spending on the project. If you wait till the very end before it's due to start it, you don't have time to do this. And I'm telling you, many times it could have been avoided that you ended up publishing crap when it could have been an excellent project instead, because you didn't give yourself the advantage of the time that you actually had available, but you didn't manage your time well. Expect errors. This is what I meant a uh, couple of weeks ago when we talked about this point for another reason. Expect to find errors. You know, sometimes we want to beat ourselves down because we, oh, every, every mistake you find in your own document, you've got this little inner demon in your head that says, you know, you're really lousy at writing. Oh, look at that, another mistake you made. Oh, are you stupid? Oh my God, I can't believe you did that. Tell that voice in your head to shut up and never to come back, okay? And make a game out of it. Say, you know what? 
for every mistake I find, I'm going to take an extra five minutes at the end of the day to do something that I enjoy. Hey, wouldn't it be great to have an hour extra of some playtime this evening? What if you find 12 mistakes? That means that's a whole hour of me, of me time for you. So you've made it a reward. You're a awarding yourself for finding mistakes instead of, you know, lashing yourself instead. Read the message at least twice. Once for meaning, like is it perfectly crystal clear what I wanted to say? Once for grammar and mechanics, I would add one more to that. I'd say read it three times for meaning, for grammar, and third for tone of voice. You don't want to send anything out that's snarky. You don't want to think that your sense of humor and sarcasm are going to be understood by everybody. Tone of voice is really important. Okay. Reduce your reading speed and focus on individual words. So when I was showing you this here, I can only look at one line at a time. And since I can only look at one line at a time, trying to separate the underdogs. Zoe, when I say the word underdog, do you know what I mean by that? Is that a term you understand? Well, it's a dog that's underneath another dog. No, I'm just kidding. An, uh, an underdog is, is, is the, the team that usually doesn't win. All of a sudden, and so, and so over time, everybody expects that they're going to lose. All of a sudden, they start, you know, hitting home runs. They start, you know, defending, you know, their high scores. They're actually leading, you know, the American League. In, you know, in the standings, they're actually now going to the World Series. They came out of absolutely nowhere to win. No one ever thought at the start of the season that these underdogs were going to actually end up, you know, winning the, you know, the World Series. But they did. And so by the end of the season, these guys, people are referring to as the underdogs, the guys that were not expected to win, but they did. Okay. That, that's, that's what the term means, but it's slang. It's another form of slang. So trying to separate the underdogs from the sure bets. Do you know what a sure bet is? It's somebody that we anticipate and expect to win because they always win. So if you go to Las Vegas and you, and you go up to a roulette wheel and you decide that you're going to put your chips on red. And the guy that's spinning the wheel has been spinning red all night long. Putting your chips or your bet on red is a sure bet. Because, man, it's been red all night. We're expecting it to win. Now, if you've been playing that black all night, but, he, but the roulette wheel guy keeps hitting red, you're an underdog until suddenly your luck turns around and you hit a hot streak and now you're winning every single spin. Now you were the underdog that ends up taking everybody's money. Follow? Okay. So trying to separate the underdogs from the sure bets is another way to say trying to identify who the losers are from who we expect to win. Now, if you're an English reader, like who this blog was intended for, you're probably not going to have any problems with this sentence. But I wasn't writing it for an international audience. If I really, really, really wanted to make sure that everyone in the world could understand this, I'd have to find some other way to do that. So reducing your speed and focusing on individual words and what they mean. I'm going to skip this. I don't care about this stuff. You know, whether you, you guys come up with your own plans on how you want to mark your documents when you find errors. These are standard ways of doing it. But again, I'm never going to test you on this. Okay. Let's look at a message and judge its effectiveness. You can evaluate your writing. Ask yourself, is if this is what I published today, and it goes out to all my employees, 
have I met my goal or objective for the document? Well, if what you get back is a bunch of questions about the document, people didn't understand it, it's pretty certain that you did not achieve your purpose. So what I'm saying is you want to look at the document and without a doubt know that every single person who picks it up is going to understand what you mean. How successful will the message be? Well, a message that elicits tons of questions is not successful. Does it attract the reader's attention? Look, in the course of a day, I may have 50, 100 emails come into my work email address. I'm not going to have time in my day to read all 50 or 100 emails. So I'm picking and choosing which ones I'm going to read and which ones I'm not. If it's an email, it's going to have a subject line. If I want to make sure that people stop and read mine, I have to have a really good subject line that tells them why they should stop and read it. It piques their curiosity, or it promises some benefit to the reader, or there's some answer to that question we asked a couple of weeks ago about what's in it for me. When I feel like there's a reason that I ought to read this, I probably will. But if it's a lousy subject line that doesn't do that, it's not going to attract their attention. Is it polished and clear? Well, everything we've been talking about tonight are things that make your document polished and clear. Does it say what you want it to? Well, that might have all the words in it, but one example of when it might not say what we want it to say is if we chose the wrong communication strategy. If I, here's, here's, a, here's a question for you guys. We've covered this in a previous lecture. If I have an audience that is either going to react negatively to my message or at best, they're going to be neutral about it. Should I take a direct approach to writing my document or an indirect approach? Direct? Yes, direct. No, I'm sorry, indirect, not direct. Indirect uh, approach because if they're going to respond negatively, I don't want to hit them with my idea that, they're, that I'm pretty sure they're not going to like from the beginning. I would, I, I, instead, I'm going to take most of the document to convince people along the way that the idea that I want them to accept is the best solution, but I'm not going to tell them what the solution is until the very end. I've used most of my communication time providing the rationale and the strategy and the persuasive stuff that I need so that when they've read all of it and they get to the bottom, even if they're not totally on board, they at least have listened and thought about my presentation the entire time. But if I hit them with an idea that they're gonna hate really early on, they're gonna stop listening before I even have a chance to persuade. I mean, if somebody hits you with a message that you don't want to hear, are you going to sit around and wait to hear all of it? Or do you just kind of shut down? We, we shut down, don't we? Most of us would. So you take the indirect approach. You basically are selling your recommendation or your idea by the way that you lead them through the document to the conclusion. And the conclusion is your recommendation or your idea. So they they totally understand where you're coming from. They know why you're making the recommendation. And even if they were not on board before, hopefully they are now, if you were really effective, or at least you had the opportunity to have yourself be heard. People didn't shut you out. On the other hand, if I take that direct approach, it's because I know that my audience is going to absolutely love what I have to say, or at worst, they're going to be neutral. If I think they're excited and they're going to love it, I'm going to lead with the thing that they're going to love. 
because I don't need to sell them into my idea. I know they're already on board because we've been talking about it for a while. I know how they feel about this subject because I understand my audience. That's understanding your audience is part of that first phase of the writing. We're all the way at the third phase now. So this is, you know, your last chance to say, does this document say what I want it to say? So it's about being clear, but it's also about choosing the right strategy. And then how do you know if it succeeds? Let's say that I'll give you a scenario and you guys tell me how you would know if it succeeds. This is a letter or a memo that comes out to all the employees from the benefits department in human resources. And it's covering off on next year's benefits package. And it's telling people that they need to review all of it and they need to choose which option they want and have the completed document into your office delivered you know, um, with a signed hard copy document by such and such a date. How do I know if my communication was successful? When you get what you ask? Yes, it's as simple as that. If people do what it was you were trying to lead them to do, you know you succeeded. Or if you don't receive a ton of questions about your communication, you know you probably succeeded. Now, it also could be that you didn't get what you expected because people aren't keeping up. <laughs> it's in their inbox, but they haven't read it yet. Like some of our students in this class, not you guys necessarily, for sure not you guys, didn't turn anything in yet. No mind tap assignments, no um, first assignment for the class project, nothing. And all I have to identify with that is that they're totally checked out. They didn't see any of the lectures where we talked about it. They didn't see the announcements that I put out about it and what was expected. They didn't go in and see the outline of the assignment in the modules area in, in, in Canvas. So it's either in their inbox or they're just permanently checked out. Now, if they're totally checked out or they're not reading, is that your responsibility or theirs? theirs yes yeah it's theirs now you could try all kinds of ways to raise the flag get their attention wave your arms around but if they're not paying attention they're not paying attention that's more their fault than and and so what you also need to make sure is when you put things out like your subject line for instance that you, you initially sent your email you know your your first message about the benefits package went out in email did your subject line have something in it that would get their attention and convince them that it was important for them to do it and you know actually complete the assignment? You hope so, right? Now, if you're at work and you're not doing this, this is a real problem. If you're a student and you're not doing this, well, you're a student. And if you wanna pass the class, you better get on the stick, right? Again, not you guys, I'm just, I'm just saying, okay. And that's the chapter for the night. Do you guys have any questions on anything we talked about? No. All right, good. Um, then um, uh, next week, we're going to do chapter five. And following chapter five, we're going to, I'm going to um, put the exam for chapters one through five in Canvas in that section called quizzes. And I'll show you guys what to look for next week. We're gonna do the fifth, we're gonna do the first exam during the same week that we're covering chapter six in class. Okay. So we've got one week. Now already, let me show you um, my canvas again, real quick. Let's see. You guys can see my screen, I think, right? Yes. Okay. So modules. 
Scroll down, scroll down, down to week four. What does this say here, you guys? It says study guide okay. chapter, chapter five topics. And so um, this is going to include all chapters for one, two, three, four, and five, including what we're going to cover next week. And then here in between, right, on the week that we're doing six, uh, chapter six, as homework during that week, you're going to have that exam to complete online. Okay. And the way that you'll do that is you'll come up here. You see where it says quizzes? Click on this. And so I've got, I mean, I'm gonna put this in student view. Okay, so here's exam one, it's already set up. It's not available to you yet. Okay, I haven't made it, I haven't made it available yet, but it'll be here, exam one. In fact, if you guys look under it, I'm looking under student view, you would see this too, okay? It's not open right now, but it's sitting here waiting. So you're gonna go to quizzes and you're gonna select exam one you'll have 70 questions to answer that come from chapters one through five. Okay. And you guys have all been doing a great job of keeping up every week. I don't think any of you guys are going to have a hard time with this. Not at all. Clear. I have it available actually. You do. Well, don't do it yet. We're not ready to do it yet. That's a little odd. Okay. Well, I'll fix that. <laughs> And it has no due date, so. It, well, there will be. I, it's, uh, I have to go in and, and establish all that. You'll have a week to do it. You'll have from um, Monday, the, the, uh, the 30th of September. You'll have from that Monday through the following Sunday at 11.59 p.m. to do it. And I don't, I don't, you're not gonna need all that time for sure. In fact, what you will have is 75 minutes, okay? throughout the week but you know do it at your pace and i think you guys will be fine okay any other questions okay oh. and that's what's going on no go oh, ahead it's oh. not about the class today but for the assignment one uh, i got an email from uh, you earlier today that you didn't receive my assignment but did i miss it paul I think so, because I, I sent it on, I put it on the Dropbox last, uh, sorry, on Monday at around three o'clock. Okay, then I'll fix that. I'm sorry, my apologies. Oh, well, I just want to make sure you, you got it. Yeah, I obviously I must have missed it, but uh, um, don't worry about it. You're covered. Thank you. Oh, no, you got it in on time. Thank you. All right, guys, thank you so much for being a good class tonight. I'll see you later. Have a good evening. Have a good rest of your week. Okay. Have a good night. Thank See you, you guys. You all take Thank care. You. Good night. You're welcome. Good night. Uh, professor, See you later. Professor. Yes. Okay. Uh, professor. Um, good night, Professor. Yeah. Um, yes. Sorry. I forgot to send you an email last week. That's totally on my part. That's my fault. I was like busy with work and stuff like that and other assignments. Okay. But I did send you an email right now um, saying if you could open chapter two assignment and quiz. I'll get that if done. That's, if it's not too late for uh, anything. I'll, 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 yeah, I'll do that. Now, because it's late, uh, um, you, you're gonna, you've lost 20% of the available points on it. As but long as I off. turn in the assignment instead of a zero, it's okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay, very good. See you later. Yeah, have a great night. You too. Bye-bye.